Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so uh, last session uh, we talked about uh, several things, in, uh, including uh, restricted Boltzmann machine, and then at the end we talked about autoencoder and metric learning by different loss functions. And now uh, we will continue metric deep metric learning by uh, Siemens networks. So, so what are Siemens networks? Siemens networks are uh, some of the important networks for deep metric learning. And um, what do I mean by deep metric learning? Learning and embed in a space by deep neural network, right? So Siemens network is very important. I will, I will tell you what they are. Okay. So Siemens and triplet networks. Uh, one of the important deep metric learning methods, as I said, is Siemens network, which is widely used for feature extraction and deep metric learning or deep embedding learning. So Simon's network was originally proposed in uh, 1993, reference nine, right? And what is that? It's a network consisting of several equivalent sub-networks sharing their weights. So it's, you can see it as two networks or three networks which share their, ne uh, which share their weights. What do I mean? It seems that you have two identical networks or three identical networks. When we say they share their weights, it means that their weights are equal to each other. Okay. So, or you can copy the weights of, from one of them to the other one. So uh, as I said, uh, they, we have multiple networks. We share their weights. And usually we have either two networks or three networks. Okay. Two or three. Uh, and a Siemens network with three networks is also called triplet network, right? And why is it called Siemens? Because uh, I think Siemens, as far as I know, is related to twins and these things. And that's the reason, because you can see that's twin networks or something like that. Okay, so, uh, and uh, these, the weights of these, uh, these sub networks are trained in a way that they, the interclass variances are increased and the intra-class variances are decreased. This is exactly what you had in uh, unsupervised uh, metric learning, right? What, what, uh, unsupervised dimensional reduction? Sorry, supervised dimensional reduction. In supervised dimensional reduction, where we have the class labels, what do we do? We usually try to increase the variances between classes, the inter-class variances, and decrease the variances within classes, the intra-class variances, right? This was the idea of Fisher, Fisher discriminant analysis. And in deep, metric learning, we are also following the same idea. So uh, the, the last functions for these for the Siemens network should do something like this, increase the interclass variances and decrease the intraclass variances. Okay. And uh, here in, in this figure A, what do we have? We have Siemens network with two sub networks. In figure B, we have Siemens network with three sub networks. And uh, usually for Siemens network with two sub networks, we have a loss named, uh, we have various losses. The most important loss is contrastive loss. So contrastive loss is for uh, two networks, but with for three sub networks, we usually have the most famous one is triplet loss. Okay, so uh, contrastive loss for figure A and triplet loss for figure B. And it has a lot of uh, applications such as in computer vision and natural language processing. So, uh, as I said, the, depending on the number of subnetworks, we have various loss functions, right? So, for usually, usually for training uh, Siemens networks and for their loss functions, they usually require what? Pairs or triplets of data points. So, if, if we have two subnetworks, we have pairs of data points. If we have three subnetworks, we have th we need triplets or three data points, and uh, so what do we do? Therefore, for Siemens network, we can't use data as it is. We need to make groups of three or two points, right, out of the data. In, in simple neural networks, you just get batches of data points and you feed them to the network, right? Here, you, you need a pre-processing for data preparation. What do you do? You get the data points and then you make triplets and pairs out of them. So this is what you do. Uh, usually, yeah, in each pair or triplet, we have an anchor point, okay? We denote it by XIA, 
A stands for anchor and I means the ith point, okay? So you can see that the ith pair or ith uh, triplet. And usually we have a, a point from the same class, the same class as the anchor point. So it's a similar point to the anchor point uh, or a neighbor point. You can call it neighbor point or positive point or similar point. And we denote it by XIP. P stands for positive, right? And we also get a dissimilar point, which is from another class, right? A dissimilar point. Uh, and we call it negative point or distant point. And we denote it by XIN. N stands for negative. So I think now it's obvious. When we have triplets of data points, one of them is in each triplet. One of them is anchor. One of them is positive. One of them is negative. Where anchor and positive belong to the same class, or they are similar, but negative is dissimilar. And what, what should the last function do if it is triplet last? Of course, it should push it. It should push the positive point to the anchor point and push away the negative point from the anchor point in the embedding space. By this, the embedding space learns to, dis to discriminate the classes, right? This is exactly what triplet last does. And uh, however, if it is contrastive last, uh, it uses pairs of points. Then in pairs of points, we either have, in some pairs, we have anchor positive. In some pairs, we have anchor negative. If it is anchor positive, we push the positive toward the anchor. And if it is anchor negative, we push away or pull away the uh, negative from the anchor, right? This is, so the idea is simple. The idea is simple. And we are doing it iteratively by back propagation. And how can we find the positive and negative? This is also a research area. So how can we find anchor positive? So anchor, if you can take every point as anchor and select a positive and negative for, them, for it, right? But an interesting thing about uh, Simon's network is that it's not necessarily for supervised learning. It can be kind of semi-supervised learning. Uh, you don't, the positive, if, if you have the class labels, you can select the positive from the same class as anchor and negative from another class uh, than uh, the anchor. However, what if you don't have class classes, class labels? It is an unsupervised problem, but you still can make triplets for training uh, an embedding space by Simon's network. How, can you tell me? Can you give me your suggestions? I don't have any class labels. How can I make triplets for training some Simon's network? I don't have class labels. How can I make Triplets of anchor, positive, negative. Your ideas. Just throw out ideas. There might be wrong. That's fine. So, what? Uh, maybe you could purpose as a like disposition or try to find. So, you're saying the kind of clustering. Before so, we put or using the same. Yeah. So, the, what is the idea of clustering? The idea of clustering is looking at the patterns, right? So exactly, you you are in the uh, right track. So you, for finding positive, we, uh, rather than class label, we can find a point which is similar to the anchor in pattern. But for negative, we should find a, a data point which is dissimilar in pattern uh, with respect to anchor, right? So this is exactly how we can do. For example, an example. There is, uh, I, as far as I remember, uh, there was a method, a paper named tile to vec okay? tile to vec as far as I remember. tile to vec What does it do? So tile to vector It's for a, a aerial images. You mean, uh, do you know what I mean? When you want to find the, the map of a city, you, you use satellites, yes, to get aerial images from the city. And they wanted to train some embedding for uh, finding semantic features of the aerial images. For example, after training, you want the uh, places which are green with vegetation to become, to have some features, but the places where we, they have houses, they become, they have another type of feature, right? So the, you, you kind of want to find a semantic feature map for the aerial images. What did they do? They wanted to make triplets and they have some patches of images, some patches of images. What do they do? They can simply, a, a simple idea is that this close by or nearby tiles, they should be similar to each other, most probably. 
but far away tiles should be different with high probability, right? Therefore, whenever they wanted to take, make triplets, they randomly selected one of the uh, tiles, one of the images, patches. They took one of uh, another tile made with some overlapping tile with it. And they, so this is anchor. This is positive. But a very far away tile and randomly, and they took, took it as negative. Of course, there might be some errors. Maybe negative is very similar to anchor, but as it is far away with high probability, it's usually uh, different, right? So here, for example, if anchor is a house, a, the roof of a house, usually positive is also the roof of the house, but negative might be some uh, vegetation, right? Some trees maybe. Uh, and th that's the idea that we also use the same idea in our own paper, I, uh, we did that for histopathology images. For histopathology images, we did that. We used the idea of tile to vec. And what did we do? We wanted to, we wanted to learn some embedding space for the histopathology patches. So we took this uh, idea exactly. We took a, a tile, a patch of histopathology image. We also took a nearby tile as positive and away, something away from it as a negative. And we could train some embedding space for using Simon's network for the histopathology images. So we, the, the idea is interesting. So, so it doesn't, we don't have to have class labels for training Simon's network. We can still make triplets and pairs using this idea, using patterns, right? Okay. So another method, another method. Assume, so this is for where you have some uh, big image, this idea. And then uh, the distance of images makes sense, right? But what if you don't have a big image like this? So big images for aerial images, histopathology images, whole slide image in histopathology images. But what if you don't have such cases, you have, some, you have a bunch of images or you have a bunch of data points. Can you tell me another idea for making uh, triplets? Any idea, suggestion? Assume I have a data point. I want, I take it as anchor. I want to make it positive. What can I do? I can simply augment it. What do you mean? We have different data augmentation types. We can rotate it a bit. We can add some noise to it. We can crop it a bit and move it. We can translate it. We can do different things, right? And then we can say, okay, the trans after uh, the, the image before transformation and after transformation are almost similar to each other, right? If the distortion is not too big, then I can take the, the image before transformation, before data augmentation as anchor, after data augmentation as the positive, and some other image as negative, right? We can do that. Okay, so data augmentation, we can augment the anchor point to take the positive interest, okay. So as I said, we, we, if we have two subnetworks, then we will have pairs of anchor positive and anchor negative. And if we have three subnetworks, we have the anchor positive negative points as a triplet. Right? Let NT be the number of triplets or uh, pairs. Right? Okay. And we have various loss functions for Siemens network, which use pairs or triplets of the data points. Okay, so we call these subnetworks. We can uh, we usually use the same network for these subnetworks, right? We have to uh, because they need to share their weights, and we usually call the network which is used as a subnetwork as we call it backbone network. Okay, and it can be fully connected network or convolutional neural network. For example, each backbone, the backbone network might be ResNet eighteen. We use that in our own work. We use ResNet 18 in Sim as in Simon's network, the structure. So it's interesting. And usually the embedding dimensionality is much less than the input dimensionality, right? Okay. So there are, as we said, the weights should be shared. Why? Why, the, why do the weights need to be shared? Because I want to pass the anchor to one of the networks, 
the positive to the other one, the negative to the, the other one, and they should pass through the same network, right? That's the reason. Okay, there are two ways to implement Simon's network uh, in computer. One way, uh, which I think is a bit stupid, is that we have three copies of the same network and we feed each of the anchor positive negative to these networks and we get the embeddings, right? But the wise thing is that we have one network, we feed to it three times. We feed anchor to it, we get the output, then we feed the neg positive, and then we get the output, and then negative, I'll get the output. As the number of anchor positive and negative is only three or two, it's not a big deal. The time complexity is not a big deal. So that's the thing. The second approach is more recommended, as I said, and it is memory efficient. Okay. So let's talk about loss functions for Siemens networks. One last function is contrastive loss, which uses pairs, anchor positive pairs and anchor negative pairs. Uh, as far as I remember, if I'm not wrong, contrastive loss was proposed by Facebook. Triplet loss was proposed by Google. Okay. So these are proposed by big companies. Uh, so suppose in each mini batch, we have B pairs of points. B stands for uh, uh, maybe batch, batch size, okay? So here, uh, in contrast to the simple regular network, when we had uh, mini, mi a mini batch of size B, we had B points in it, right? Here we have B pairs or B triplets, right? And B pairs, and they might be anchor positive and anchor negative in them, okay? Uh, the points in an anchor positive pair are similar. It's denoted by set S, similar. And the points which are anchor negative, they are dissimilar, denoted by D, set D, right? Then let's define this. Why do I say similar and dissimilar? It means that either they are in the same class if we have class labels. If we don't have class labels, we have found them some in some techniques that we, we talked about, right? Okay. Then if uh, I define YI, to be zero if they are similar, to be one if they are dissimilar for all of the points, right? For all of the pairs. Then uh, the main contrastive loss, which was, which was because we have several variants of uh, contrastive loss. The main one was proposed in 2006. You see, it's not very old. And uh, it's, it's this. Equation 11 is the contrastive loss. Theta here is the weights of the neural network which we train by backpropagation. And this is the loss. So here we have one minus uh, yi times this distance and yi times this. Okay, let's talk about these each one by one. What do I mean by f of xi1? It means that I have fed xi1 to the backbone network and f of xi, uh, xi1 means the embedding of the xi1, the output of the neural network, right? And also I have f of x i2. So it means that I feed the anchor to the network, I get the embedding. Also I feed either the positive or negative to the network and I get the embedding, right? And d of them means the distance of them. Can be any distance that you want to use in the embedding space. It's usually Euclidean distance or a squared Euclidean distance, right? Okay. And so you also have it here. However, depending on whether it's anchor positive or anchor negative, we'll behave it differently, right? So here, if they are similar, then yi is zero, right? Then this becomes zero. Then we have only this term. This term goes away, right? Then what, what, is this, what does it say? It means that I, I want this distance to be minimized, minimized, right? The distance of the embeddings of anchor and positive should be minimized. Should, they should be pushed to each other, right? However, let's talk about the case where the pair is distant, uh, anchor negative. If it's anchor negative, then what happens? Then this becomes zero. This goes away, this term. And what do we have? We have this term. We have this term, the second term. 
the second term. And what is the second term? Here we have this this notation, which is defined as maximum of its argument and zero. What do I mean? I don't, I don't want this to be, uh, if it becomes negative, I don't care. If it's positive, it's exactly equal to, its, to itself. But if it becomes uh, negative, saturated by zero, right? Maximum of something and zero. This is also called a standard hinge loss. We had seen the standard hinge loss in some other function. Can you tell me? ReLU, exactly. This function is also used in ReLU activation function. But if it is a, a cost function or loss function, then it's called the standard hinge loss, right? Okay, so here I'm saying that I want to minimize minus D of F of XI1 and f of xi2 plus m, right? When I say I minimize this, m is some scalar called margin. It's positive, okay? Then if I say it's minimized minus distance, it means maximize the distance, right? It means that maximize the distance of anchor and negative as expected, as expected. However, what is this m doing? And what is this standard hinge loss doing? It is saying that push away the negative from anchor up to some margin m, up to some margin m. After that, I don't care. After they become far away, after to become the dis until the distance becomes m, then don't push it further. You get it? This is as that's why it's called margin. Why? Why am I doing that? Because I don't want to push them to become too away from each other. It will explode the ambient space, right? You want the classes to be separated, but they shouldn't be too much far away. Okay, that's the reason. I think now you understood contrastive loss. Once we have a, a pair of anchor positive fed to it, once we have a pair of anchor negative fed to it. And when we have a mini batch, in a mini batch, we have a mixture of positive anchor, uh, anchor positive and anchor negative pairs, right? For anchor positive pairs, the first term applies. For anchor negative terms, the second term applies, right? Okay. So this is uh, as this is exactly our analysis, and this is the figure. So we have anchor here, we have positive, and we have negative, right? Negative here is red. Uh, diamond, but anchor and positive are uh, blue and green circles. So we push positive toward anchor and push away the negative, right? Until what happens? C, figure B. Figure C is not for this last function. Figure B. Until the negative, the distance of negative and anchor becomes M, right? Okay. Now let's talk about triplet loss. It was proposed in 2015, very close to now. Okay, so what does it do? We have triplets of, mini batches of triplets, and this is a triplet loss. So it, as you see, it's a bit different. Here, we have triplets of anchor positive negative, and for anchor and positive, the distance should be minimized, right? Exactly correct. For anchor and negative, minus distance should be minimized. It means that the distance should be maximized. That's correct. But we still have the standard hinge loss with the margin M. But the interpretation is a bit different here. It means that here inside, I carry it only if it is positive, right? When it becomes negative, I shouldn't care. And what does it mean? Let's talk about it. When, when does this become? Uh, negative. Can you tell me? So when do I? Uh, when don't I care about it? Let's let's write it down. D of f of x i a and f of x i p minus d of f of x i a f of x i n plus m. When it becomes negative or less than or equal to negative, I don't care. Right? Not care. Just rearrange this. What do you get? 
you will get equation 13, right? So my goal is to reach this. After that, I don't care, right? My goal is to reach equation 13. And what is equation 13? Let's analyze that. It means that the distance between anchor and positive plus some margin becomes less than or equal to the distance of anchor and negative. As long as, so this, the distance of anchor and negative, which is this, is greater than or equal to the distance of anchor and positive, which is this, plus some margin. It means that the, the negative becomes, it kind of, it roughly it means that the distance of negative and, and the positive becomes at least M, right? Roughly it means that. As you see, so this interpretation is different from contrastive loss. Okay. So in both triplet loss and contrastive loss, we are increasing the interclass variances and in, uh, decreasing the interclass variances. Okay, that's correct. Another loss function is neighborhood component analysis or NCA loss proposed in 2005, but not for deep learning. It was proposed as a loss function for regular dimensional reduction without deep learning using gradient descent. Right, is a simple optimization problem. But we can implement it. Whatever you can optimize using gradient descent, you can also optimize using neural network, right? Therefore, later people used NCA in neural network. At that time, 2005, it was proposed by Hinton et al., right? Okay, so what do they do? It's, it's also when they use that for uh, Siamese network, it can be seen as a loss function of Siemens network. What does it do? It minimizes the negative log likelihood using Gaussian distribution or softmax form, right? So this is exactly softmax form, right? Equation 14, this is the NCA loss. So what does it do? It says minimize minus log of this. What is this exactly softmax? But softmax of what? Let's see. It's the this here in the numerator, we have e to the minus distance of anchor and positive, their embeddings, right? I will say in the denominator, I have the, the summation of the distances of anchors and negatives, all permutations, right? Do you see? And why do I have this softmax for? So it becomes, its summation becomes one kind of, it be behaves some sense of probability. And I, uh, minus, I have minus log for the sake of negative log likelihood, right? Okay, when I minimize this, let's analyze it now. Minimize this minus, we can drop the minus and say it's maximizing, right? Maximize this. And when we say maximize this without the negative, so it means that the numerator should be maximized, right? Let me think, I think, let me think. Did I make any mistake? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, exactly, I'm, I'm in the right track. So minimize minus log means maximize log, right? <laughs> A maximize lag of something, it means maximize that thing because logarithm is a monotonic function, right? Therefore, I'm maximizing this softmax form. When I say maximize a softmax form, it means that maximize the numerator. Maximize e to the minus distance of this. Maximize e to the minus distance, it means maximize the distance, minimize the distance, right? So maximize e to the minus distance means maximize minus distance means minimize distance. Let me repeat it. Minimize minus log of something over something. You can see it as maximize log of something over something. You can see it as maximize of the numerator. What is the numerator here? E to the minus distance. So maximizing this is equivalent to maximize minus D because exponential is a, monot is a monotonic function increasing monotony. Then this means minimize D. Did you, did you understand the analysis? So it means that I'm minimizing the distance of anchor and positive as expected. 
with the same interpretation, you can have the same interpretation for denominator, then it means that you're, you are maximizing the distance between anchor and negatives, right? As expected. So this last function is doing, again, the ideal triplet and contrastive loss, but in another way, in another way, in a probabilistic way, right? Okay. Uh, for more information on other, there are a lot of loss functions for Simon's networks. We just reviewed the most important ones. You can see our tutorial paper, Spectral Probabilistic and Deep Metric Learning Tutorial and Survey. You can also see uh, our uh, chapter uh, in our textbook, Deep Metric Learning. Okay, now that we talked about uh, the loss functions for Simon's networks, let's talk about triplet mining as a pre-processing for Simon's network. How can we improve Simon's network using data? Using data. Of course, choosing the triplets makes a huge difference on Simon's embedding, right? Also, this last function chooses a, make difference, a big difference, makes a deep, big difference. But here, let's talk about choosing the triplets. And that's called triplet mining. What do we do? It means that how do we Find the positives and negatives in a good way, in a good way. Assume, assume I have either class labels or I know somehow how, uh, how similar patterns are and how dissimilar the patterns are, right? So I assume I know to do that, but how can I choose the triplets? So for an anchor, I have a lot of options for positive. Which positive do I choose? For an anchor, I have a lot of options for negatives. Which negative do I choose? That's called triplet mining. Okay, so we can use all similar and dissimilar points for every anchor point, right? Or we can you choose some of the similar and dissimilar points and that's called triplet mining. Okay, let's see. Suppose B is a mini batch size and C of XI is a class index of XI, which class label it is. And XJ denotes the points of the Jth class in the mini batch. So here I'm talking about so in every mini batch, I'm talking about how to choose the triplets and pairs in the every mini batch. We have two ways to do triplet mining, online or offline. In offline, we choose the triplets before starting to train. But in online triplet mining, while training, whenever a mini batch comes, then I choose the triplets and uh, pairs, and I fit it to the network for, last, uh, for back propagation. Right, so that's called online triplet mining. Here I'm talking about online triplet mining. One of them is batch all. Batch all triplet mining was proposed in 2015, very new. And what does it do? It considers all points in the mini batch, which are in the same class as anchor point. Sorry, uh, all points in the mini batch, which are in the same class as the anchor point are used as positive points. So all positive options, take them all, right? And also all points in the mini batch, which are in different class, take them as negative. So all, consider all permutations, okay? That's called batch all. So as you see here, I have summation over the batches, but in each batch, I see, I, I take XJ as the positive, where it uh, for all I take all of the points which belong to the same class as XI. For negative, I take all of the points which don't belong to the uh, same class as XI. This is what is this notation? This means minus in as for sets. It means the whole X minus XC, right? Subtraction in set, set theory. Okay, so this is batch all, and it takes all of it uses all available information. Batch hard, batch hard triplet mining was proposed in 2017. What does it do? It considers every point in the mini batch as anchor point. All of the, every point is anchor point, but how do we choose the positive and negative? It takes the hardest positive and, and hardest negative. What do I mean by hardest positive? What is uh, harder for a neural network to learn? a near positive to the anchor or a distant uh, positive to the anchor from the anchor? What? 
This stent is harder. Why? The distant positive from the, an anchor is harder for neural network to train. Why? Because it needs to push that to the anchor. So the hardest positive means that the furthest, the uh, uh, farthest point from the anchor. And hardest negative is what? The closest, the closest point uh, to the anchor from the other class, right? So closest point to the anchor point from another class. So it takes the hardest positive and hardest negative and uses them in the uh, triplet class, for example. And here you can see, here I'm saying that for this distance, choose the xj, which has the maximum distance, right? For the negative xk, choose the xk, which minimizes this distance, which is the closest to the anchor, right? Okay, batch hard takes the hardest cases and other cases are expected to be learned properly. So the philosophy of batch hard is that let's take hard on neural network. When it learns to consider the hardest cases, probably the easiest cases will be automatically learned, right? Okay. You can see it as it can be justified by opposition-based learning. Opposition-based learning says, uh, Whenever you learn something, learn its opposite too. So you can say the opposite cases or the hardest cases, let's learn them too. Okay. Batch semi-hard triplet mining was proposed in 2015. It takes every point as the anchor point and all points in the mini batch, which are in the same class as the positive point, but it also takes the hardest negative. So it's a combination of batch hard and batch all. For positive, it takes all of them. For negative, it takes the hardest one. Okay, for negative, it takes the hardest one. However, hardest negative, which is farther than the positive point. You also should note that. Batch semi-hard is a bit complicated. It, it takes hardest negative, but the hardest negative, which is farther than the positive point. Okay, and here is the condition Con where the hardest negative is a way farther than the positive point. Okay, easy po positive. It was proposed in 2020. Can you see? They are very close to now. It takes ev considers every point as anchor, easiest positive as the positive point, and all points in the other classes as negative. So for negative, it takes all of the negative points, but for Positive, it takes the easiest. And what is the easiest? Positive is the closest. Uh, and the, these have been published in very high prestige conferences. I think this a, uh, easiest, easy positive, I think it was proposed in CVPR, something like that. These are very high prestige conferences. Uh, and uh, we can use a triplet mining approach in NCA loss function too. So for example, uh, here in uh, the previous equations, I was using them in the triplet loss. You can use in other loss functions for Simon's network too, right? Okay. R rather, but rather than using the extreme cases, hardest or positive, right? These are the extreme cases, right? We can sample positive and negative points from the points in the mini batch. So one approach was using the extreme cases, positive, easiest, or neg uh, hardest positive or negative, right? Another approach is that let's sample. But for sampling, we have also several options. We can sample it from the existing points in the mini batch, or we can, we can find some distribution and sample from that distribution. If we sample from that distribution, it means that maybe our sample is never ex existing in the mini batch, right? We're just generating some new sample from the distribution. Okay, there are several uh, approaches for positive and negative points to be sampled. Sampled by extreme distances, as we talked about, sampled randomly, sampled by distribution, but from existing points, sampled from the distribution stochastically from distributions of the classes. All of them can happen. First, second, and third approaches, these sample positive and negative points from the set of points in the mini batch. But the fourth one, Samples it from distribution. 
the third and fourth approaches sample points from distributions stochastically. And uh, one example is distance weighted sampling proposed in 2017. Another example is Bayesian updating theorem based on Bayesian updating theory proposed in 2021. This one, Bayesian, is ours. I, I proposed it with my co authors uh, in 2021. Uh, we used I, as far as I remember, inverse Warshall distribution. It was very interesting. We wanted to incrementally learn the distribution of the batches of the classes, because when during the back propagation, batches are coming, right? Therefore, you will get more information from the distribution. We tried to implement it as an incremental data distribution. And it was very interesting. You can take a look at that. Reference 27. Okay, acknowledgement, this slide, this slide deck is based on our tutorial paper, Spectral Probabilistic and Deep Metric Learning, or our uh, textbook. For more information, you can see our uh, tutorial, because there are a lot of other things which I didn't cover, but you can see it in my uh, tutorial paper. And these are the references. Let's go see them. Okay. So let's go to the next topic. Okay. Variational autoencoder. So that for variational autoencoder, we need variational inference. In the other class, I have talked about variational inference. So the first part of this lecture, this slide deck might be uh, repetitive for the ones who already have had the statistical machine learning. But the second part is different, okay? Because variational autoencoders models variational inference as a neural network. So variational inference, what does it do? Let's see. Consider a data set x1 to xn, okay? First off, focus on the, this lecture, this variational inference is a bit theoretical. You need to focus. Consider a data set x1 to xn. Assume that every data point, which is d-dimensional, is generated from a latent variable zi, which is a p-dimensional. So you can see it in this way. zi generates some xi. You can see it in the world a lot. A lot of these are, this is observed, but this is latent, right? And these latent variables, we might not be even aware of. Okay, the latent variable has a prior distribution, P of zi, right? So each of these, you can see them as random variables, right? According to Bayes' rule, we have this. Probability of zi given xi equals probability of xi given zi times P of zi over P of xi. Let P of zi be an arbitrary distribution, and I denote it by Q of zi, okay? A prior on the latent variable, okay? Suppose the parameter of the conditional distribution of zi on xi is denoted by theta, right? So each distribution has some parameter. For example, Gaussian distribution has mean and covariance, right? Each distribution has. So if, when we have we consider the parameters, we can write it in this way also. The Bayes rule becomes like this. P of zi given xi and theta equals p of xi given zi and theta, p of zi given theta over p of xi given theta, right? Okay, now consider KL divergence, kurback labeler divergence between the prior probability of the latent variable and the posterior of the latent variable. First off, what is KL divergence? So if we have two points, we can measure their distance as a difference of the two points, right? But what if we have two probability distributions, two probability density functions, two PDFs, okay? A measure of difference, it's not distance, but it's a measure of difference of two distributions. One of them is Kale divergence. When it is zero, it means that the two distributions are exactly equal, equivalent, right? It means that their moments all of their moments match. But when the, it's positive, it means that they are different. 
There is no upper bound on KL divergence. When its lower bound is zero, it never gets negative. Okay. So well, let's consider the KL divergence between the prior of a latent variable, uh, which is ZI, and the posterior of the latent variable, which is P of ZI, given XI and theta. Why am I doing that? Because I want to minimize this, because I want the probability of ZI given XI to be as close as possible to the prior distribution of ZI. This is what I want to do finally. Let's see. Okay, according to the definition of KL divergence, I have this. This is the definition of KL divergence. Note that KL divergence is not symmetric. What? Okay, and this is KL divergence, continuous KL divergence, right? And that, that's why we have integral. And now I'm using log, log this formula, logarithm of A over B is logarithm of A minus logarithm of B to write it in this way, right? Okay, then what do we do? What was equation two? According to this equation two, P of ZI given XI and theta. So here I'm replacing P of ZI, I'm replacing P of ZI given XI and theta by equation two, the base rule that we have. Okay, so we have three terms, these, these, and this in the denominator. Again, I use the formula of logarithm of A over B equals logarithm of A minus logarithm of B. Also logarithm of A times B equals logarithm of A plus logarithm of B. So it, it is broken into these terms, right? Okay, then what do we do? Then what do we do? We know that logarithm of P of X I given theta is independent of Z I. What do I mean? Look, the, the, this one, this one. This is inside the integral with respect to Z I, right? And it doesn't have any Z I in it. Therefore it can become out of the integral and we will have logarithm of P of X I given theta times integral of D of Z I. What is the integral of D of Z I over all domain? It's one, therefore it becomes this times one, which is itself, plus the other terms inside the uh, integral, right? Then I use this formula in a reverse way. So uh, therefore I can write, compact the terms in this way, right? Compact uh, these two, th this and this, also this. So I can bring, the, bring this to the power of QZI and then bring it back from the power to here. Okay, then what do we have? I can write this denominator. So P of X I given Z I and theta times P of Z I and theta according to the chain rule, I can write it as P of X I and Z I given theta, right? Then this is exactly the definition of KL divergence. So I can write it as KL divergence of Q of ZI and P of XI and ZI given theta, right? So we simplified this KL divergence to this term, okay? Then consider this left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Rearrange it, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Rearrange it, you will get equation three. So I'm bringing the KL divergence to the one of, one of them to the other side, and then I will have equation three, okay? So this is exactly what we found in equation three. I'm repeating it here. We define evidence lower bound, also called elbow. This is a very important thing in probabilistic machine learning. Very important, evidence lower bound or elbow. I define it as this, minus scale divergence between Q of ZI and P of XI and ZI given theta. I denote it by L of Q and theta. This L, don't confuse it with Lagrangian. This is evidence lower bound. L stands for lower bound, okay? And then if you use this definition in this equation, you will get this. Rearrange this term rearrange this term, you will get this, equation five. However, we know that KL divergence is always non-negative, right? It can be zero or positive. Therefore, this term, 
this term is non-negative. So you have something minus some non-negative value. What do I mean? What does it mean? It means that this is always less than or equal to this. Equation six, right? L equals this logarithm minus something which can be either zero or positive. Therefore, this L is less than or equal to logarithm. I think it's obvious, right? From equation five to equation six. Why? Because this subtraction which you have in the right-hand side is not negative. Right? Why do you look at it in a confused way? Did you understand? So you have logarithm of p of x i given theta minus zero or minus three. It's either equal or less than this logarithm. Okay. So this likelihood p of x i given the theta is also called evidence. Okay. So when does this lower? This is lower bound, right? Now I think you understand why we call it evidence lower bound because it's actually a lower bound for the evidence, right? And we usually want this lower bound to be tight. What do I mean? So the, this is also a lower bound. This is also a lower bound. Which one is better? This one, because it mimics the behavior of the function. And this is very close to the original function and that's a tight lower bound, the right-hand side. So when does this, we want it to be tight lower bound to be more accurate. Therefore, this should be almost equal to this, right? If we want this to happen, what happened? According to equation five, this, this scale divergence should be almost zero, right? But we know that scale divergence also is non-negative. It's greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, it's sandwiched between zero and zero. Therefore, it must be zero. When this is zero, what happens? This is equal. Qzi, Q of zi is exactly becomes equal to the probability of zi given xi and theta, right? So this is what we want. We want to have this. We want to. Okay. And we found this. So uh, here we can visualize it. We can visualize this equation that we had in the previous slide. Let's visualize it. So this is elbow, L, the evidence lower bound. Uh, this is the Kale divergence. This is the Kale divergence, right? So this is A, this is B, this is A, this is B. A plus B becomes C, right? We can visualize it in this way. But let's see. What do we want to do? According, we want to do expect, uh, maximum likelihood estimation, right? We want to maximize the likelihood of uh, data. So we want to maximize the log likelihood of data. And we know that according to equation six, we have this lower bound, right? When I want to maximize some function, I can maximize its lower bound. It's a technique in optimization. When you want to maximize some function, you can maximize its lower bound. When you want to minimize some function, you can minimize its upper bound. Okay, so here, rather than maximizing uh, log of p of x i given theta, let me maximize the lower bound, evidence lower bound. Okay, we want to do that. However, there is a problem. There's a problem. What is that problem? I have some variable which is not completely known, okay? Not completely seen. When I want to do maximum likelihood estimation, but I have some variable which is not, or I have some unseen data, I need to first find that unseen data and then do the maximum likelihood estimation. This procedure, this algorithm is called expectation maximization. So expectation maximization in short is this. You have you want to do maximum likelihood estimation, MLE. Some data is unknown or unseen. Let's replace that unseen data with its expectation, its mean. Then everything will be known. Then I can maximize the likelihood, right? 
This is a, for more information, you can see the lecture mixture models in my statistical machine learning course. Okay, for more information on expectation maximization. So this is exactly what we are gonna do. Expectation maximization has two steps, E step and M step, expectation step, maximization step. Expectation step as is, is exactly what I said. Let's replace unseen data with this expectation. Maximization step maximizes the likelihood, the likelihood, right? So expectation says, I want to maximize this lower bound, but with respect to Q. So Q is the unseen thing. I find it, I replace the Q with Q with a, what I found, then everything is known. Let's maximize it with respect to theta to give me the theta. Then I repeat this procedure until convergence, right? I repeat these two steps until convergence. That, that's exactly called expectation maximization algorithm. Okay, so E step in expectation maximization for variational inference. What I talk, what I'm talking about is called variational inference. Okay, the E step is this. So I have this lower bound maximize it with respect to Q. What was Q? The prior distribution, you remember, of the latent variable, latent factor. So maxima, and we know according to equation five, the, the evidence lower bound equals this logarithm and minus this scale divergence. We just found it. And therefore I can maximize these two terms. I know that max maximize of minus something is equivalent to minimize that. So I can replace it with minimization of scale divergence. The second term, this scale divergence is always non-negative because scale divergence is always non-negative, right? Therefore its minimum is zero. Can't go for below zero. So for minimizing this, this should be set to zero in the second term. Therefore, it means that these two distributions should be equal to each other, right? Because when two distributions are equal, to the two distributions are equal to each other if and only if their k divergence is zero, okay? So therefore, this E step can be seen as assigning P of ZI given XI and theta to Q of ZI. E step is over, finished, okay? Let's analyze it. What do we mean? In the figure, it pushes the middle line, which is elbow, toward the above line by maximizing the elbow. You are maximizing this elbow with respect to Q. So this means that we are pushing this upward. Okay. Okay. Let's do, do the M step. Let's see the MS step. Maximize this uh, lower bound again, but with respect to theta this time. So we know that now I use the other definition of, so I had several equations for the elbow, right? Equation four was one of them. Maximize this. This is the definition of elbow. Maximize this minus KL divergence. Then I use the definition of KL divergence, which is this integral. Right, I uh, then I use the formula of logarithm of a over b is equal to logarithm of a minus logarithm of b. Therefore, I can simplify this in this term, so it, it breaks into two integrals. Now, the second term, the second term is a constant with respect to theta. Right, therefore, I can drop it. I can drop it. Why am I allowed to drop it? Because the argument of optimization is important to me not the optimum cost function. If the optimum cost function is important to me, I can't drop it. The second term is a constant, but the argument here is important to me, the theta. Therefore I can drop it. So I will have only maximization of the first term. Now, interestingly, this is exactly the definition of expectation in continuous form with respect to this. Uh, so this is the probability and this is the function, right? So I'm maximizing this expectation. Again, as you can see, this equation 11 as what we, as a result of 
maximization step, M step. It assigns the argmax of this expectation to theta. We just proved that, right? Let's analyze it now. We have this. What does this do? It maximizes this logarithm. It's mean, expectation of this mean, uh, this logarithm. And what is this logarithm of P of Xi and Zi given theta? It's like you are in also, when you are increasing this, it's like you are increasing logarithm of P of Xi given theta. Therefore, you are increasing this, you're pushing this likelihood above. As you can see, they are just playing a game, a E step and M step. E step pushes elbow above to reach lack likelihood. M step says not so, not so soon. M step pushes lack likelihood above. So elbow chases lack likelihood. Uh, uh, elbow goes further. It's like uh, elbow is a police and lack likelihood is a thief, something like that. They're playing a game. Until elbow gets close to the lack you, close to that, and becomes tight. And you can, so let's summarize the ESTM and M step in these equations 12 and 13, right? Uh, sometimes the parameter theta is absorbed into the latent variable zi. Then how can we, so we have P of xi, zi, and theta, right? According to the chain rule in probability, we can write it in this way, P of x, i given z, i and theta, P of z, i given theta, and P of theta. Then I can write these two as P of z, i and theta, but theta is the parameter of z, i, therefore I can absorb it, so I can write it as P of z, i, and also write these as P of x, i and z, i, and P of x, i given uh, z, i. Then it changes the equations of M step and E step a bit, a little bit. Why do I say that? Because in some books, you might see this version. Okay, so far we talked about variational inference. You might be wondering how is it related to deep learning? Now we are seeing that we see how it is related. Uh, we, now we are gonna implement variational inference in a neural network. For example, in a statistical machine learning, I said that variational inference is used in factor analysis and probabilistic PCA. It, uh, so variational inference can be used in various algorithms. Here, we are gonna use that in variational autoencoder. So variational autoencoder, it was proposed in 2014. New, it's new. I think as far as I remember, Max Welling was one of the co-authors of this variational autoencoder, and he's a, one of the important scholars in machine learning. He's in Europe. Okay, so it applies variational inference. It maximizes the elbow, but in an autoencoder setup. So it's the name of this paper is autoencoding variational days. They are making it that, like an autoencoder and makes it differentiable for the backpropagation training. So it uses backpropagation to, to maximize the elbow. Let's see. As this figure shows, variational autoencoder includes an encoder and decoder. Of course, that's why it's called autoencoder. Each of which can have several network layers, right? Okay. And by the way, they can be fully connected or convolutional neural network, whatever. A latent space is learned between the encoder and the decoder. Exactly what? Usually in all autoencoders, we have encoder decoder and some latent space in the middle. The latent variable or latent factor zi is sampled from the latent space. So what is the difference? Dif there is a difference between reconstruction autoencoder and variational autoencoder. Reconstruction autoencoder, we saw that in previous session. Here it was encoder. Here we had decoder. We fed x to this. It gives us some embedding vector z. Then we fed, feed embedding vector z to decoder and gives us some x hats maybe, right? This is reconstruction autoencoding, where we try to, uh, the last function is, for example, mean squared error between x hat and x. However, in variational autoencoder, z is different here. 
I, Z is not an embedding vector right now, which is output of encoder. No, Z is not output of encoder in variational autoencoder. In variational, in reconstruction autoencoder, Z is the output of encoder. However, in variational autoencoder, my output of encoder gives me the parameters of distribution. For example, if it has two parameters, if it is Gaussian distribution, it gives me mean and covariance. If it, it has, maybe it, uh, if I consider another distribution with three parameters, it gives me those three parameters, each of which might be a vector, right? So this is several neurons. For example, here, uh, my Gaussian distribution is uh, three-dimensional, three, uh, multivariate, three-dimensional. Mean is 3D. You might, you might say covariance should be three by three, nine. Not, it needs nine neurons, right? Or as covariance is symmetric, it at least needs one, two, three, four, five, six neurons, right? Half of the triangle. However, we usually use diagonal covariance. Therefore, we need only three, right? Did you, did you understand? In variational autoencoder, the output of encoder is the parameters of distribution. Then after I get the parameters of the distribution, I have some PDF, right? Therefore, now I can sample from that PDF probability density function, right? Then the sampled point from the probability density function in the latent space is called ZI, the latent variable, right? So you have a process here in the latent space. Reconstruction autoencoder is very easy. ZI is the output of encoder. In the variational autoencoder and in the probabilistic, also called inferential autoencoders, you have some process in the latent space. You, you get the parameters, you have the PDF, you sample from the PDF. And then you have ZI, the sampled variable, latent variable from the probability density function. You feed it to the decoder. Then you get some output. Reconstructed XI. Okay. This is the ideal variational autoencoder. So the encoder, what does encoder do? It models the distributional Q, QZI or pure, what was QZI? Probability of ZI given XI and theta. So here, why am I saying that? Because you, uh, you feed XI to it, you get the parameters of the distribution of ZI. That's why it models probability of ZI given XI, right? The decoder, on the other hand, models probability of XI given ZI because you feed ZI to it, it gives you XI, right? Now, I think it's interesting that you can see encoder and decoder as two distributions, two conditional probabilities. Okay. And what is theta E? The weights of the encoder, the parameters of encoder. E stands for encoder. Here, as I said, we have, assume we have M number of points where M is the number of parameters in the distribution. For example, if we have Gaussian distribution, we have M is two, mean and covariance, right? So we have M sets of output neurons from the encoder. Why do I say M sets? Because you need a set of neurons for each parameter, right? Because each parameter might be a vector or matrix, right? If it is a matrix, you can reshape it to become a vector. Then let's the, denote e, uh, the output of encoder as E of J, J so uh, for the J set of the output. Uh, I mean, J parameter. So you, you, we model P of ZI given XI and theta E, assume it's multivariate Gaussian. Then we have the mean, which is p-dimensional. Let e, E1 will be a p-dimensional vector. The covariance will be a P by P. So P is squared neurons. We need P of squared neurons, but we don't need all of them because it's symmetric. Doesn't matter. Usually we use diagonal. Therefore, we only need P neurons. Only P neurons is enough which is the diagonal of the covariance matrix. Here it is. Okay, then after these, these are outputted from the encoder. Now the distribution of ZI given XI is obvious. 
Now I can sample from it. Now I can sample from it. Okay, I think I talked about it. When the data point XI is fed as input to the encoder, the parameters of conditional distribution of Q of ZI are obtained, hence the distribution of latent space, which is Q of ZI is determined corresponding to the data point XI. This is an important thing. The pram, every time you feed some data point to the encoder, the distribution of latent ZI, P of ZI given XI differs because the parameters change. So it's, it's dependent on the XI. Interesting. Encoder says that ZI depends on XI. Decoder says the other way around. ZI depends on XI given on Z, depends on ZI. Encoder says ZI depends on XI. Decoder says XI depends on ZI. Interesting. We have two random variables which depend on each other. <laughs> okay. So ZI is sampled. This means sampled, right? Sampled from this distribution determined by the encoder. Then ZI is fed as input to the decoder, which we'll talk about it. Okay, let's talk about decoder now. The decoder models probability of XI given ZI and theta D. Theta D is the weights of decoder, right? Parameter. As you see, variational inference, we had theta as a parameter of distribution. Here, here theta becomes the weights of neural network. Here, okay. And the input and output of decoder, the input is p dimensional of zi, output of d is d dimensional xi. Okay, obvious. Then the output neurons of decoder are supposed to either generate the reconstructed data point or determine the parameters of the conditional distribution. So decoder, we have two type variants in the literature. Either it gives me the output you can consider it as xi, xi hat timing reconstructed, or you can also treat decoder similar to encoder. It, you, it can output parameters of some distribution of P of xi given zi, and then you sample xi from that distribution. The former is more common. Usually it only outputs xi. Okay. In the latter case, then we have several as sets of parameters. Okay. So now recall variation expectation maximization, which we saw in variational inference. It was this, right? Now here we want to implement it in variational autoencoder, which we saw. You can see interestingly, we had so in variational inference, we had. E step and M step, which were playing some game, right? Here in variational autoencoder, E step is modeled by encoder, M step is modeled by decoder. So this is encoder, this is decoder. Yes, as far as I remember. Yes, that I'm right. So here, as you see in E step, I'm training, I'm finding the weights of encoder, theta E. In the decoder, in the M step, I'm finding the parameters of decoder, theta D. Okay, now my parameters are theta E and theta D. Okay. Here, this is what we had, right? I'm repeating it here again. Here we have arg max. There is a problem here. What is the problem without looking at this slide? What is the problem? Whenever in a neural network, you want to maximize something, what is the problem? A very fundamental problem. Usually in neural network, we minimize the loss function. In backpropagation, it's usually implemented to do gradient descent rather than gradient ascent, right? Therefore, we need, we simply, we can say, let's minimize minus cost which we want to maximize, right? So rather than saying that arg min of L, say arg, arg, rather than saying arg max of L, say arg min of minus L, right? Then you can write it as in, in gradient descent. So this is exact, gradient descent is equivalent to backpropagation. Backpropagation is gradient descent plus chain rule, right? So this equations 18 and 19 are gradient descent, which are 
back propagation. But where, what, why do we have plus here? It was negative times negative. One minus for gradient descent and min one minus behind the cost functions. All right? Okay. So it became positive. Okay. And theta E and theta D are the learning rates. Recall equations four and 12, which we saw. I'm repeating them here. Okay. <clears throat> elbow, <clears throat> let's simplify. Let's simplify the elbow. So this, why am I simplifying this? Because I have them here in equations 30, 18 and 19. I have them. Summation of elbow over the batch, mini batch. All right. Uh, elbow, I can replace it with its uh, definition minus KL according to equation four. This was equation four, right? Then I know that Q of ZI in the E step, I remember. I was assigning P of Z, uh, ZI to give an XI to Q of ZI. Therefore, I can replace Q of ZI with P of ZI given XI, right? Okay. Note that the parameter of probability of XI and ZI given theta, theta D is theta D. Why? You should note this. Is theta D. Why? Because ZI is generated after the encoder and before the decoder. Am I right? Here, this well, we uh, in the ES step. Do you remember in ES step? We were this is in ES step. This parameter theta has to be theta E. Uh, theta. Give me a second. <clears throat> Yes, this should be theta E and this should be theta D. Why? Because theta E encoder gives me ZI. However, here this should be theta D because now I fit XZI to the decoder and I get XI. Okay. Now there are different ways we need to approximate this scale divergence in equation 12. We want to... Uh, make it simplified for backpropagation. Okay, let's approximate it. There are different ways to do that. There are different ways for approximating the KL divergence in equation 12. We can simplify the elbow in at least two different ways, which we explain in the following. Okay, one way is this type one, simplification type one. We continue the simplification of elbow as this. So we had this, this is exactly what we found in the previous slide. And now, what do I do? Just give me a second. Yes, there is a relation between KL divergence and expectation. You can, you can write uh, KL divergence as its uh, definition, which is integral of something. Then this integral, you can see it as an expectation also. Then it becomes this. Okay, then what do I do here? I'm replacing this Q with P of ZI given XI. We had it, do you remember? We had it here. Okay, so the expect this expectation can be approximated using Monte Carlo approximation. This is an important thing in machine learning. Whenever you have expectation and it's, it is given you headache, you can replace it, approximate it by Monte Carlo approximation. What do I mean? <clears throat> Expectation of a function, you can write it as, you can sample several, several samples from the distribution of that, and then you take the mean or average of them, of that function. So expectation of function of something, you can see it as a mean of a function of that thing over the samples. The more the sample size, the better the approximation. Okay. So you, this is called Monte Carlo approximation. So what do we do? We draw L samples, Zij, where J goes from one to L, right? Corresponding to the ith data point, right? To the Xi, corresponding to Xi. From the conditional distribution as this. So we have probability of Zi given Xi and theta E encoder. 
we sample L O L samples. We draw L samples. So I call it Z I J. Each of which is p dimensional, right? Then we want to call it approximation. I can, as I said, we can uh, approximate this expectation by this mean. For more information on, on Monte Carlo approximation, see my tutorial on sampling algorithms from survey sampling to Monte Carlo methods, okay? And f of zi is a function of zi here, okay? So this is what we had. I'm repeating it. Now let's do the Monte Carlo approximation. So we can replace this expectation with this mean one over L summation over L uh, samples. Then I use the formula of logarithm of A over B equals logarithm of A minus logarithm of B to simplify this, okay? So this is the first simplification done. Sometimes this is used in the literature, okay? Simplification type one. Another simplification is simplification type two. How? So this is exactly summation of uh, L and this is what we had in the several slides ago, minus summation of this scale divergence. Now, what do we do? I replace this scale divergence by its definition integral which has integral in it, right? Then what do we do? I can write this denominator, break it into two, these two by chain rule in probability. Probability of xi and zi given theta d, I can write it as probability of xi given zi and theta d times p of zi, right? Then what do we do? Then I just, yes. So I'm, I'm using again the formula of logarithm of A over B equals logarithm of A minus logarithm of B. So I have this in the denominator. I can write it as minus logarithm of P of ZI, but I have all one minus also here, it becomes plus. Also this term, I have minus logarithm of this. So uh, th those two minuses cancel each other then that becomes plus. By the way, this P of Z i remains here. Sorry, I'm working on P of X i given Z i and theta d in the denominator to appear here, right? So far clear, I simplified it. Then I can use the, the I see that this is the definition of KL divergence again, right? So I can write it as this. And this is also, I can see it as a definition of expectation. I can write it in this way, all right? You see, you are learning the techniques. So we had K divergence. We use the definition of K divergence once to simplify it. And at the end, we use the definition of K divergence again and the definition of expectation again. So we, these are the techniques which you can play around with in machine learning. So we found this, we found this. The second term, Again, we can use Monte Carlo approximation. This is expectation. Let, let's use Monte Carlo approximation. So this is approximated lower bound. I can approximate the second term with the, uh, expect, uh, with the Monte Carlo approximation, right? So this is what we had. Now let's talk about the first term. The first term can be converted to expectation there is always a relation between KL divergence and expectation because when you have KL divergence, write, it, write its definition. Its definition has some integral and you can see that as a definition of expectation also, okay? So it can, it can be converted to expectation and then computed by Monte Carlo approximation again, where we draw L samples from P of ZI given XI. So if we do that, so we can convert it to convert this KL divergence to this expectation. And then I replace this expectation approximated by Monte Carlo approximation. So I'm using Monte Carlo approximation. I have used it twice. Okay. In case we have some families of distribution such as Gaussian distribution, right? So 
my, I want the uh, distribution of uh, latent variable in, uh, in the latent space to be Gaussian. Then it becomes simpler for P of Z and uh, given X and P of Z. The first term in equation 26, where is that? This, this one, the first term can be computed analytically. In the following, we simplify equation 26, which is this, for further for Gaussian distributions. Now let's assume it's Gaussian distribution and it becomes simplified further. So we, uh, we can compute the KL divergence in the first term of equation 26, that KL divergence analytically for univariate or multivariate Gaussian distributions. For this, we need two following lemmas. You can see our tutorial paper for proof, okay? For this lemma, I have referenced some paper. For this lemma, you can see the appendix of my tutorial, okay? The, for the proofs. So the K divergence between two univariate Gaussian distributions, P1 and P2, they are univariate, right? They are only one dimensional. Then the K divergence between these two Gaussian distributions is equal to this. It has mu one, mu two, sigma one, sigma two in it, right? Also, if they are multivariate Gaussian distributions, they have several dimensions, P1 and P2, then we have covariance matrix rather than variance, right? It is, then the uh, KL divergence between them becomes this. Sigma one and sigma two are covariance matrices and mu one and mu two are the mean vectors, okay? Consider the case in which we have this P of, as, as I said, I assume P of zi given xi is a uh, Gaussian distribution. Also P of zi is a Gaussian distribution because I want to simplify it further. Okay, zi is p-dimensional, right? There, uh, the parameters mu of z given x and sigma z given x are trained in, an, in a neural network while the parameters uh, p of z i, j i can be set to zero and identity. So this one for these two, I can set these to zero, these two identity, why? because the prior distribution of zeta is in my control. What prior do you want? I want it to be a standard normal, right? So I can choose these inspired by the prior distribution of Z in factor analysis. In factor analysis, we also do that, okay? According to lemma two, the approximation of elbow, that was equation 26, can be simplified to this. So this, uh, so here, do you remember this was equation 26 or, or here, I have repeated that here. So this is equation 26, right? So I know that this scale divergence, I said either you can use Monte Carlo approximation for that, or if it is scale, if it is Gaussian, we don't need to do approximation anymore. We can solve it analytically using the lemma. The lemma simplified the scale divergence if they are Gaussian, right? If we use lemma, then it becomes equation 32. Interesting. Interesting. Now you understand why mostly in variation of autoencoder, we use Gaussian distribution as a prior because it simplifies it. Okay. We can train variational autoencoder with expectation maximization. It is possible. Where Monte Carlo approximations are applied to elbow, as we discussed. Then equations 18 and 19 are replaced by the following equations. So what is the difference between these two? I have replaced L with L tilde, which is approximated lower bound using Monte Carlo approximation. You're right? And I do back propagation. Now here in this slide, an important technique in machine learning, in probabilistic machine learning is introduced. Reparameterization trick. Reparameterization trick, if I can pronounce it correctly. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? Sampling the L samples from the latent variables, equation 15 was this, right? This was the sampling the L samples. 
it has a big problem for backpropagation. What is that? It blocks the gradient flow. In backpropagation, you need chain rule of operations, right? You need chain rule of activation function, you need chain rule of what, whatever. We saw that, right? How can you have the probability of sampling in the chain rule? I sample from, I sample ZI in the latent space. You need to take derivative of that also in the, uh, when you want to. So you, you go from the end of the outer encoder, and you could come down, down, you go through the decoder, you reach the latent space. In the latent space, you're sampling. How can you take derivative of sampling? That's a big pro problem. It blocks the gradient flow because computing the derivatives through this by chain rule gives a high variance estimate of gradient. In order to overcome this problem, we use reparameterization technique proposed in 2014. In this technique, instead of sampling this directly, okay, we assume that i is a random variable, but it is a, a deterministic function of another random variable, epsilon i. So you can see that zi is the output of some deterministic function of a random variable. Right, you are kind of uh, well. I forgot the word in English. Uh, so, uh, give me a second because the word I think is good to understand. Give me a sec. What was the word in English? Deceive, am I right? Cheat or fool, fool. I think the word, the good word is fool. You want to fool it, okay? You want to cheat or you want to fool the network, like the back propagation. What do you, so, so it's the same thing. ZI is random, but rather than saying that I've sampled it, I said, oh, no, I consider it as the, uh, as, output of a deterministic function of another random variable epsilon i. And so I can write it as this, and this function is denoted by g here, where epsilon i is a stochastic variable sampled from a distribution. Epsilon i is a random variable sampled from some prob probability. Okay. So equations 21 and 25 were these. Okay. These were equations 21 and 25. Both contain an expectation of a function f of zi. We are still in the reparameterization technique. Both contain an expectation of a function f of zi. Do you agree? So this is function of zi. This is also a function of zi. Using this technique, the expectation is replaced by this. So rather than expectation of f of zi, the function of zi, I have expectation of f of g of epsilon i. Right? Interesting. So I'm replacing it with this. Using the reparameterization technique, the encoder, which implemented P of ZI given XI, is replaced by G of epsilon I XI, right? The, de the deterministic function. Where in the latent space between the encoder and decoder, we have, we have this. Now we have sampling of epsilon I from its distribution, and the ZI is just an output of the deterministic function. A simple example for the reparameterization technique is when zi and epsilon i are univariate Gaussian variables. Let's see. So assume epsilon i is a, a standard Gaussian distribution, and I want my zi to be a, a sample from a Gaussian distribution with mean mu and variance sig sigma square. But I don't want to sample zi from this distribution. I can write zi as mu plus sigma epsilon i. As when epsilon i is a standard Gaussian, mu plus sigma epsilon i becomes a Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Do you see that? Okay. For some more advanced reparameterization techniques, you can see reference 11. Okay. 
In practice, variational autoencoder is trained by backpropagation, where the backpropagation algorithm is used uh, for training the weights of the neural network, the encoder and decoder, right? So recall that in training variational autoencoder with expectation maximization, the encoder and decoder are trained separately using ESTEM, ESTEP and MSTEP of EM respectively, right? So I want to use the e, EM in the variational autoencoder. As I said, we had ESTEP and MSTEP, right? They were separate steps. Here, it says that very, uh, when we want to train it by backpropagation, we can also relax it further. We're always relaxing things, right? We're simplifying it. Let's simplify it further, relax it further. Let's consider the whole network together and not in separate steps, okay? So you will have only one loss function now, okay? And you have the parameters set up, you aggregate the parameters set up E encoder and decoder as theta, then you just, uh, you always maximize the elbow or you minimize minus elbow over the mini batch. This is exactly minimizing minus elbow or maximizing elbow using backpropagation. Rather than two steps, you do it in one shot, okay? So, and this is using mini batch a stochastic gradient descent. We minimize the negative elbow or maximize the elbow. Nowadays, usually this is used for variational autoencoding. Okay, now test phase. So you trained the neural network. It has maximized the elbow at the end after convergence. Then you want to test it. How? In the test phase, we feed the test data point xi to the encoder. What does it give me? The encoder gives me parameters of the conditional distribution of latent space, P of zi given xi. Do you agree? If, for example, P of zi given xi is a Gaussian, it gives me mean and covariance, right? It gives me the parameters. So for xi corresponding to xi, I will find some distribution of zi given xi. Then I sample zi from that. Then I fit zi, so I sample zi. Then I fit zi to the decoder. Decoder gives me reconstructed, corresponding reconstructed data point xi by the decoder. As you see, it's stochastic, it's probabilistic. Once you feed xi to it, it gives you some reconstructed data. You do it again with the same data point, you, it might give you a bit a little bit slightly different X reconstructed XI. Why? Because every time ZI, although the distribution will be the same, but you're still sampling from that distribution. Your next ZI might be different for the same XI. You get it? You get it? I have encoder, I have decoder, I have ZI, which is sampled. I feed xi to this, it gives me some xi hat. I feed the same xi again. It might be a bit z another zi, zi prime, z, zi prime. Then it gives me xi hat prime. Xi and xi hat prime are very similar to each other, but they are slightly different because zi and zi hat are a bit different, right? Right? As you see, it's a stochastic. In Python, in PyTorch, if you want to get the same result all the time for the same XI, what should you do? You should set the random seed. You should set the random seed. And as you see, it's a generative model. Where, where am I? It's a generative model which generates data points. One of the problems of variational autoencoder is generating blurry images. It generates blurry images. When data points are images, because data points might not be images, but when they are images, it generates blurry. Image. The blurry artifact maybe is for several reasons. Do you remember we had Monte Carlo approximation? Approximation makes it less accurate. We had lower bound approximation. 
We didn't maximize the lock lock fluid. We maximized its lower bound. So we also, we have restrictions on the family of distributions. We usually use God, simple Gaussian distribution. Maybe some other prior distribution on the latent variable is better. How do you know the Gaussian is the best? We are lazy. We use Gaussian. Okay. Note that generative adversarial networks or GAN, which we'll see the next topic, usually generate clearer images. Okay. Therefore, some works have combined variational and adversarial inferences. They have combined them using the ad advantages of both models. This is an example of variational autoencoding. This is how it looks. So what, this is the credit of image. You can see they have implemented that using Keras. Uh, Keras is just uh, a library for neural network based on TensorFlow. So uh, what is it? I think it, they have trained on MNIST dataset. MNIST is a digit handwritten digit dataset, zero to nine. So what is the left-hand side figure? It says that I have in, uh, samples of nine, 10 classes, zero to nine. I, for each of them, as I said in the test phase, I feed it to the encoder. I get some probability distribution. I sample ZI, I feed it to the decoder. It gives me some embedding, right? However, here they are in the left-hand side, they are plotting ZIs, the latent variables. And P, P, the dimensionality of latent variable between encoder and decoder is set to two, set to two, right? It's two dimensional, right? So although XI is D dimensional and D is a number of pixels of the image because they reshape every image to become a vector as far as I remember, okay? Or they, in the initial layers, they might use convolutional neural network, doesn't matter. Okay, D is a number of pixels, but the embedding dimensionality is two. And as you can see, the, the, the learned latent variable, P of ZI given XI is semantic here. It means that the neural network has been trained correctly. The same, uh, the points of the same class have been clustered in the same classes next to each other. For example, this is class zero. Where is this? This is class eight, this orange one. Why is should zero fall close to eight? Because zero is very close to eight. This is zero, this is eight. If you twist it a bit, it becomes eight. And seven and nine also are close to each other because if you do this to seven, it becomes nine, right? So left-hand side, uh, these classes have been separated, but similar classes have fallen close to each other correctly. Therefore, it's semantic. In the right-hand side, they have traversed on the manifold of latent space. What do I mean? In the latent space, which is two-dimensional, they make a grid and they take uh, from the... Uh, what one point in the grid, they feed it to the decoder, it gives you some reconstructed data. Then they move a little bit to the right or to the bottom in the grid, they feed it again. They put the reconstructed data points next to each other. So this is output of some latent variable, but next to it, its latent variable is a bit, a little bit different in the grid of the latent space. Then these are the reconstructed. As you see, you can see how the latent space is behaving. So this corresponding latent variable gave seven. You change it a bit, you change it a bit, apparently seven becomes one. It means that in that latent space, when you move toward that direction, you are moving from seven to one. Interesting. When you move down, seven becomes nine. Then nine becomes gradually zero. Zero becomes gradually six. Zero is very similar to six. Then six becomes gradually five. Five becomes here in the diagonal, becomes gradually three. Three becomes gradually eight. Eight becomes gradually nine. 
nine becomes gradually one because you, when you shrink nine vertically, horizontally, it becomes one. Interesting. Interesting. Acknowledgement. As, as some, some slides are based on our, our tutorial paper, factor analysis, probabilistic principle component analysis, variational inference, and variational autoencoder. We can also see our textbook uh, on dimensional reduction. So some slides are inspired by teachings of deep learning course at the Carnegie Mellon University. You can see their YouTube channel. It's very good. Uh, also variational autoencoder in Keras. You can see them. These are good. Okay, these are the references. Any question? No? Okay, let's uh, have a break and come back at uh, nine, five, nine, seven, nine, seven. Okay, now we uh, we talked about uh, variational autoencoder. Now let's uh, talk about ge generative adversarial network and adversarial autoencoder. This is another uh, generative model, which is which was comp competitor of adversarial, sorry, variational autoencoder. Let's what this one. This one is uh, after variation, but a variational out. What? Yeah, I think it's newer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's it came after a uh, variational autoencoder, and after this also there is a state of the art generative model which is called diffusion model. Uh, but yeah, there are these are this is the progress of AI so far. Okay, uh, generative adversarial network introduction. Suppose, suppose we have a generative model which takes a random noise as input and generates a data point. Okay. We want the generated data point to be of good quality, right? Hence, we should somehow judge its quality. Somehow we should judge it. One way to judge this is what? The judge can be human. We judge it visually. But there is a big problem. We can't take derivative of humans' judgment. <laughs> right? We can't take derivative of humans' judgment. Otherwise, we would use that for backpropagation. What? Yes, humans' judgment is also subjective. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe if uh, someone uh, likes arty things, then the, it would generate arty things, but someone mm, likes robotic things, then it would generate some robotic uh, shapes. Okay, so GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, it was proposed in 2014, has the same idea, but it says rather than uh, Using human's judgment, let's use a classifier as a judge. Okay, a classifier. So uh, we can have a binary classifier or also called discriminator to classify whether it's a good uh, generated point or not. And this classifier can be a pre trained neural network, right? By the way, uh, when I say the classifier says whether this is a good generated point or not, I can model it in this way. The classifier says whether this point is real or fake. By fake, I mean whether it's been generated or not. Whether it exists in the world, this is an image of an existing, for example, animal in the world, or no, this animal never existed. We made that. We generated in the image. Okay. So the classifier can say, Rather than saying that whether it's good enough or not, you can say whether it's fake or real, right? And this classifier can be pre-trained network. I can train a classifier and then use that as a judge, right? But GAN 
puts foot ahead <coughs> where goes one step ahead says no let's train the classifiers simultaneously to the generative model so at the same time that i'm training the generative generator let me also train the classifier and this makes a game between them between the classifier and the generator why because a generator tries to make good and better and better images or data but the classifier wants to say whether it's generated by you or it's real so generator tries to fool the classifier because by generating very good things that the discriminator or classifier assumes that it's, it's real but that also discriminator or classifier wants to make it make itself stronger not to be fooled by the generator so there is a game between them and they compete with each other right by this competition they both become stronger one way in the real world one way to get stronger is that you compete in, in a good way in a good way then you become stronger you both become stronger by competing so they make each other stronger gradually by it's this competition okay it is not for this adversarial the term adversarial in adversarial uh, generative adversarial network the term adversarial is used in two main streams of research in machine learning right one of them is adversarial attack GAN or generated adversarial network is not related to adversarial attack at all you shouldn't confuse these two okay these are two separate things what is adversarial attack it means that assume i have trained a neural network on some images maybe on images of animals then in the test phase i uh, assume i give uh, yeah an image of elephant it, it predicts it's, this is an elephant but adversarial attacks tries to change the data in a way that visually it's still elephant it by changing some of the pixels wisely that when you feed that image of elephant the uh, the network says it's not an elephant it says a fox it's a fox so it completely uh, attacks the neural network by changing the data slightly it's like interesting that's called adversarial attack it's related to security adversarial learning however is exactly uh, what we talked about we have a generator and a discriminator and they are adversarial to each other they're competing with each other in an adversarial way and by this competition they become both uh, stronger okay adversarial game so the original GAN also called vanilla GAN it was proposed in 2014 consider a d-dimensional data set with n data points x1 to xn each of which is d-dimensional in GAN we have a generator g which takes a p-dimensional random noise right z as input and outputs a d-dimensional generated point x d-dimensional right so you can write it in this way g is a mapping from z to x it takes z and outputs x let the distribution of random noise be p of z so a prior distribution of the uh, latent uh, noise we want the generated x hat to be very similar to the to some original or real data point x in the data set okay again we need a module to judge the quality so we can use classifier or discriminator also called critic right we denote it by d it takes x as input and outputs either zero or one zero means it's for example zero means it's generated or fake one means it's real so it's a binary classifier okay the perfect discriminator outputs one for real points and zero for generated points. However, it's not perfect. It, gener uh, it generates some probability between zero and one using a sigmoid function as its activation function in the last layer. 
So if it's closer to zero, it means that it's, it's uh, more probable to be fake. If it's closer to one, it's more probable to be uh, real. And we can uh, uh, use a threshold, maybe half, to decide whether which class it is. Okay. So I think it's obvious. If the generated points is very good, it can fool that discriminator and its score will be close to one. It means that it has fooled the discriminator. Okay. The discriminator can be, as I said, a pre-trained classifier, but let's train it at the same time simultaneously. Then, so discriminator, gener on, on the one hand, generator tries to generate realistic points to fool the discriminator. On the other hand, discriminator tries to discriminate the fake point from a real point. By fake, I mean generated point. Okay, so we have an adversarial game and this game is zero sum. This is related to game theory. In game theory, we have cooperative games, we have adversarial games, this is adversarial game, which they compete with each other. And what do I mean by zero sum? Because uh, uh, we usually have payoffs. The, uh, the uh, agents, the agents in the game, they have some payoffs, benefits, right? They try to increase, maximize their payoffs, each of them, right? Also in economy, it's used. The companies want to maximize their payoffs. So they compete with each other. If the, pay, the summation of the payoffs becomes zero, what do I mean? If I take anything, you will take nothing. If you take everything, I will take nothing, right? So the summation of our benefits becomes zero. Then it becomes a zero sum game. Sometimes we don't have a zero sum game. Sometimes when you when you take everything, I still get something, or I get I lose something. Okay. Optimization and loss function. We denote the probability distributions of data set and noise by p of data and p of z. Z is a latent factor, latent variable noise. The prior of it is p of z z. Data, its probability is P of data X. So P of data X is the probability, this is the probability of distribution of the data set. Okay. This figure shows GAN, generated adversarial network. So we have Z sampled from the prior of Z. It can be a Gaussian distribution, for example, right? Some noise. We feed it to the generator. It gives us X, the data. It generates data with some probability distribution, P of G of X. P of G of X, G stands for generate generation. This, is, this might be a bit different from P of data X. Ideally, it should be P of G should be equal to P of data, ideally. At the end, this is our desire, but never P of G might reach P of data, right? And also we have P of data, X from P of data, from the data set, we feed these two, to the discriminator, it should decide whether uh, the X as input is fake or real discriminator. This is a binary classifier. This is sigmoid activation function, right? Okay. And the loss function, now let's model it mathematically. The loss function is this. We denote it by V of D and G. Uh, v stands for value in game theory. We have that value or payoff. V of D and G. Uh, so we have this, this is cost. The first term is expectation of log of D of X with respect to X uh, distribution of data. The second term expectation of, is expectation of log of one minus D of G of Z with respect to Z, probability of Z. What do I mean? The first term, by the way, this loss function is maximized by the discriminator and minimized by the generator, right? So as, I, as you see, they are adversarial. So let's see, did I explain this? Okay, yeah, here we are gonna analyze this last function. The first term in this equation, the first term here, is the expectation over the real data, right? Okay, the term is only used for the discriminator, why? This first term is a constant with respect to G. It doesn't have any G in it. So when we have minimize of G, we don't care about the first term, it's a constant. 
But when we maximize with respect to D, we care about it, okay? While it is a constant for generator, okay. D of X, we know that it outputs one or larger label for real data, right? Therefore, discriminator maximizes this term. Do you agree? For real data, for real data, we want D of X to be high. Therefore, we maximize it because it assigns a larger label to the real data. When you maximize D of X to become closer to one, it's like you are maximizing log of D of X. And you have also expect expectation because you might have a mini batch, right? Now let's talk about the second term. The second term in equation three is expectation over noise. First off, why do we want to maximize it? Because it's expectation over data and data should be real. And for real, the discriminator should output one. Right. The second term is expectation over noise. Therefore, it should output zero. Ideally, for noise, uh, so expectation over noise, it means you are kind of ex expect having expectation over fake data because noise is fed to the generator and it gives you fake data, generated data. So this is kind of expectation over generated data. So for D, D should output zero for that, right? And what, what is this? G of Z means output of generator, generated point. If you feed it to the D, it should give me, ideally for discriminator, it should give me zero. So it sh this should be minimized. Therefore, minus D should be maximized. Therefore, one minus D should be also maximized. Why do I have one minus D? Because D is between zero and one. 1 minus d also becomes between 0 and 1, but the, uh, the other way around, right? So I want for noise, I want d of g of z to be close to 0, so I minimize it. Therefore, I maximize minus d of g of z. Therefore, I maximize 1 minus d of g of z. Therefore, I maximize log of 1 minus d of g of z, right? For discriminator, the explanation is complete, right? Okay, now also logarithm, by the way, is a monotonic function, so we can use logarithm. And uh, as opposed to the discriminator, the ge generator now, let's talk about generator now. Generator is minimizing this last function. The first term is a constant with respect to generator, so we don't care. The second term, what happens? The second term, however, it wants D of G of Z to be what? One. Generator wants D of G of Z to be one. So to fool the discriminator, right? If D of G of Z is one, the, the generator will be happy. So G, D of G of Z should be maximized. Minus D of G of Z should be minimized. One minus D of G of Z should be minimized. Logarithm of one minus D of G of Z should be minimized. Therefore, we are minimizing this. Now I think it's obvious. The last function is explained, right? As you see, this is a mean max problem, also called mini max optimization problem. Mini max and maxi mean, these are very important optimization problems in game theory. We can use alternating optimization where we optimize over D and then over G iteratively. Once we opt we assume G is constant with respect to, we optimize with respect to D once, then we, we assume D is constant and we optimize with respect to G and we do it, it uh, iteratively. For more information, see my optimization course on YouTube for alternating optimization. Okay, then the original GAN, what does it do? It uses one step of stochastic gradient descent for each of these updates. So one step of gradient, stochastic gradient descent for this, and one step for G. For D, we use gradient ascent. Why? Because we are maximizing it, plus. For G, we are use gradient descent because we are minimizing it, minus. Okay. As you see, when, when I find the D, I put it in the last function. Okay, I use that D, optimize in the last function. Also, 
I use the previous G, updated G in the for the D. K here is the iteration index. Here, derivatives with respect to D and G, what, what do I mean? What do I mean derivative with respect to discriminator? It means derivatives with respect to their parameters or weights, they are neural networks, okay? And uh, gradient ascent and gradient descent, we are, I already talked about it, we can have mini batches, we can have mini batches, so we have, use mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And with uh, paper one, I think, which is the original GAN, as far as I remember, it suggests that equation four can be performed, this equation can be performed for several times before performing equation five. This is a suggestion of original GAN. And the main author was Goodfellow, Jan Goodfellow. Now he is in Google. Uh, he suggests that. Uh, you can do several iterations of gradient ascent in equation four and then do equation five. Okay. Uh, another way to solve this optimization problem in GAN is simultaneous optimization, in which uh, equations four and five are performed at the same time and not one after the other one. Okay. Now, uh, let's take a look at minimax versus min maximin in GAN. So do you remember this we had min, min max of V, min with respect to G, max with respect to D, right? Can we change the order? By changing the order, it becomes maximin problem. Under some conditions, these two equations are equivalent. C reference 10 for it. It's a book for, see, for seeing which conditions, okay? In practice, what Yes, okay, so we saw that. And in practice, the discriminator and generator are two deep neural networks, right? By the way, who said they, are, they should be deep neural networks? It can be any model. It can be just optimization problem. It can be any model. But now we can use uh, deep neural networks for them. The first layer of discriminator network is a D-dimensional. Why? Because it, why? is the first layer of discriminator D-dimensional because it should take the data or generated data. And its last layer is one-dimensional with a scalar output. Why? Because it's a binary classifier. And it it's also has, uh, in the original GAN, they used max out activation function. Recall the activation function lecture. For all layers except, for all layers they use max out, what the last layer you should use sigmoid activation function. Why? Because it's a binary classification. Okay. It outputs a probability of whether it's fake or real. The closer to one, the output to one, the, prob the more probable it's, it is to be real. The generator network, its first layer should be p-dimensional. Why? Because it takes the noise as input. It outputs a d-dimensional. Why? Because it should generate data. Right. In the generator, a combination of ReLU and sigmoid activation functions are used. Okay. The space of noise as the input is called latent space, this space, or latent factor. Each of the equations four and five that uh, what we had, they are used uh, performed by back propagation to train the neural networks. Equation four trains the uh, discriminator. Equation, equation five trains generator. Optimal solution of GAN. Now let's go to the theory of GAN. Please take a look at this. This is important. Theorem one. So for a fixed generator, assume 
we have a fixed generator G. Do you remember I said in the alternating optimization, once we assume G is fixed, now let's find the best D discriminator. We are gonna do that. For a fixed generator G, the optimal discriminator is this. D star is the optimal for the fixed G, is P of data over P of data plus P of G. P of data is a, is a distribution of data set. G P of G is a distribution of generated data, right? Where, uh, let's see the proof. V of D of G is this. Why? I'm using the definition of expectation as integral, right? So if you use the definition of expectation in the last function of GAN, it becomes this. The first one is over X, the second one is over Z. Why? Because of the expectation. What, what is it over? Expect, the first expectation is over data. The second one is over noise. Now, do you remember G of Z was equal to X because it outputs X, right? So Z becomes G inverse X, right? Now I take differential from the sides. D of Z becomes G inverse X, D of X. So why am I doing that? Because I'm gonna use change of variable in the integral, okay? So uh, now I can replace this D of Z with this, right? This should be now X, I guess. Sorry about that. So we found this, I'm repeating it here. Now, the relation of distributions of input and output of generator is this. Why? Because G inverse of X is Z, Z times P of P Z of Z equals P G of X. Now I can replace this Z with G inverse of X here. I'll have P Z of G inverse of X times G inverse of X. Okay. And here, here, let me think. Give me a second. So the first term, I'm repeating it here. Okay. I'm using equation nine here. Let's see. So I have PZ G inverse of X times G inverse of X. PZ G inverse of X. PZ. Yes, here, here. I guess there is some, uh, something here is dropped as far as, I, as far as I remember. Look, it doesn't matter. There might be some typo here. Doesn't matter. These two, I'm replacing them with equation nine. Therefore, I'm replacing them with PG of X, PG of X. Then I have this logarithm, okay? So here I'm obtaining this line by putting equation nine in, the, in this line one. And then what happens? Both of these, by the way, are with respect to X, so I can aggregate them into one integral, right? With respect to X. So I'm doing that. This is the first integral, this is the second integral. Now we know that for optimization, we need to take derivative with respect to D because I, have, I assume G is fixed. Now I'm optimizing with respect to D. Let's take the derivative of this with respect to D. What happens? I will have, yes, I think I'm right. With respect to D, yes. Gives, um... yeah, 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 I'm right. So, once when you take with respect take derivative with respect to uh, d, it cancels out the integral. Do you agree? Derivative is the opposite of integral. It cancels out the integral, but you still need to do the chain rule. The chain rule. So we'll have the first term plus the second term. The first term, the derivative of logarithm of something becomes that thing over one over that thing times the derivative of that thing. So we'll have this p of data over d of x. Also, I'm taking derivative of this with respect to d of x. So it becomes one over one minus d of x 
but its derivative again as a chain rule gives me minus here and I have p of g here. Now I, I have two fractions. I make the den one uh, shared denominator. So I set it to zero, right? When I set it to zero, the numerator needs to be zero. So the numerator needs to be zero. Rearrange this, it gives you this. This is exactly what we had in the theorem. But does it make sense? Can you tell me, does it make sense? We saw the proof, but does this equation eight make sense? Yes, why? Because when we have a perfect G, assume the G which was assumed to be fixed is perfect. Then P of G becomes equal to P of data. Probability of generated points becomes probability of data. If you replace P of G here with P of data, what happens? It becomes D, D star becomes P of data over P of data plus P of data. It becomes half. What does this mean? What does D equals half mean? Which means the output of discriminator is half. This is completely confused. It can't find out whether it's zero fake data or one generated data. It's half complete. The discriminator after the, this game says, I give up. I can't find out whether it's real or generated. Did you see the beauty? Interesting. So it makes sense. Now, I think, I think this is ex uh, another thing. Yeah, the optimal solution of GAN. Now let's prove that. Let's prove that what we had in as intuition that P of G should become P of data. Let's prove it mathematically. The optimal solution of GAN is, is this. P of G star equals P of data. Let's see the proof. V of D star and G, assume I have D star now, okay? D star, which we found before. Put it in the last function. And I'm using the, the integral definition of uh, expectation also in the last function. If you do that, so I'm replacing the D star with what we found. Then I'm also, do you agree that I can write this as this times two divided by two, right? I can also write this as this times two divided by two. Okay, then what happens? Then I bring these two twos in the denominators outside. I'll have plus log of one half, plus log of half, right? So they become minus log of four, okay? Also, here, what is this? According to the definition of Kale divergence, so you have two KL divergences. You have two integrals, right? The first one is KL divergence between P of data and P of data plus P of G over two. The second one is a KL divergence between P of G and P of data and P of G plus over two. Also, I have minus log of four at the end, right? So this is what we found. I'm repeating it here. The Jensen-Shannon divergence or JST, is defined as this. What is this? Do you remember I said K divergence is not symmetric. For making the scale divergence symmetric, they have defined something named Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is symmetric. What does it do? It says, take the K of P and half of P plus Q, also K of Q and half of P plus Q, and take the average over two right? Then it becomes symmetric, right? You can see it as a symmetric version of Kale divergence, okay? So this also becomes zero when, to when the two distributions are equal, right? As both Kale divergences are non-negative, JST is also non-negative. By this definition, this is the Jensen-Shannon bit. This is two times Jensen-Shannon divergence between P of data and P of G. Compare this equation 13 with what we had. We'll get equation 14, right? We know that 
we want to mi minimize this v of d star n g y because generator minimizes this last function. Discriminator maximizes that. We are talking about generator now. Generator minimizes that. For this to be minimized, what should we have? This is constant, goes away. This, its minimum is zero. It's not negative, right? When is this zero? When these two are equal to each other, right? We just proved that. So corollary, we know that, what do I mean by corollary in, in conclusion, in conclusion. So if you put, so we had this, we also would know we found this, right? If you put it here, so this becomes zero. Therefore, the loss function after training, after D beco uh, discriminator becomes perfect, I mean, becomes completely fooled, completely confused. Generator becomes completely perfect to fool the discriminator, right? It means that training of GAN is done. The loss function becomes minus log of four. So the last function becomes negative, okay? So, as I said, we had this, the, if the discriminator and generative have enough capacity and at every iteration of, of the alternative optimization, the following occurs. What, what do we have? The discriminator is allowed to reach it to its op optimum value, which is this, which we found. And P of G of X is updated to minimize this, right? Then we'll have this. This is what we found. So let's see the proof. The Kale divergence in equation 12, this is what we had in several slides ago, okay? What these two Kale divergences, they are convex functions with respect to P of G of X, right? Okay. With sufficiently small updates of P of G of X, it converges to P of data. Do you agree? Because this is Jensen-Shannon divergence between P of data and P of G. So P of data, as we saw, P of G becomes P of data. This equation 12, which we used here, holds if equation eight holds. That is the discriminator is allowed to reach to its optimum value. I mean this. When does this happen? When this happens, okay? The GAN loss can be restated as this. By the way, these are the justifications of Yuan Goodfellow. Important. Okay. Where F is the negative logistic function. You can, this is F. So if you use this function, you can rewrite the last, functions, the last function of GAN as equation 16. In fact, the function f can be any concave function, okay? This formulation is slightly different from the original GAN in the sense that here the discriminator d outputs a real value to scalar without any activation function. Why? Because I'm using this function. When I'm using the function f, then I don't need any activation function to bound it between zero and one. If D outputs half and zero, it means that it is completely confused in equations three and 16, okay? So in equation three, the original GAN. In equation 16, if it outputs zero, it is confused. So in, in this version of GAN, D outputs a float value between minus infinity and infinity. If it is positive, it means that it's real. If it is negative, it's fake, zero is confusion. However, if it outputs between zero and one, half is confusion, right? Okay. After satisfying several reasonable assumptions, you can see this reference as 17 for the assumptions. Again, with last function of equation 16 is locally exponentially stable, okay? So, these are the theorems which say why GAN is working. I haven't provided the proof, but there is a lemma, Nash equilibrium in GAN. Why? 
I'm telling you the important things in GAN. One of them is Nash equilibrium. As I said, you can see GAN as game theory, right? And what in game theory, we have several agents playing some game, but they should converge to something, some, to some state. And these convergent states are called equilibrium. Okay. One of the important equilibriums is Nash equilibrium. And what is Nash equilibrium? Nash equi equilibrium is the state of gain where no player can improve its gain by choosing a different strategy. Okay. When we have several states, when does the Nash equilibrium happen? When they can't choose their strategy. They say, I'm good. Okay. Have you seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind? Yeah. I think the most important uh, part of that movie is where uh, they are in the bar that they, they see some girls coming and one of the girls was very hot the other ones were average and uh, his friends were saying that oh take a look at the hot girl let's go for it Nash uh, thought about it and said we shouldn't all go to get the hot girl because he ca she can't have all of us she will and she will probably reject all of us but after the rejection when we go to the average girls they will also reject us why because we first went to the hot girl they will not like that and we will not get late okay so what should we do the better approach is to go to the average girls and ignore the hot girl that is the nash equilibrium okay see that uh, movie and I think it's uh, very interesting and nowadays companies are working on N Nash equilibrium okay at the Nash equilibrium of GAN we have this what is this V of D star and G star it means that when D is optimal G is optimal it is better than V of D and G star but less than V of D star and G, G. Why? Why does this happen? Because discriminator maximizes V, generator minimizes V. So generator, when generator is optimum, V is a small here. When D is optimum, V is large. But in the middle, we'll have a middle case scenario, which is the Nash equilibrium. Experiment, empirical experiments have shown that GAN may not reach its Nash equilibrium in practice, right? Okay, regularization can help the convergence of GAN. Actually, it's very hard for GAN to converge. If you do it in practice, you will see it's hard. Okay, so we use regularization also. Conditional GAN. So GAN was unsupervised. Why? Because you had some generator, you had some discriminator. Generator was outputting the, the data points and the discriminator says whether it's real or fake. In the test phase also, we've sampled some noise, we feed it to the generator, it gives us some data point. One of some data point is completely unsupervised. There is no class label. But what if we have class labels and in the test phase, I want to tell it generate some data points from class one. Assume I train GAN on animals. If I use original GAN, it might generate anything, giraffe, dog, whatever, elephant. But what if I want to tell GAN, no, generate some random giraffe, generate some random dog. I don't want cat, right? then you, you should use conditional GAN, conditional GAN. So what is that? In GAN, we don't have control to generate a point from a specific class, okay? User cannot choose specifically what class to generate points from. Conditional GAN was proposed in 2014 also called conditional adversarial network, it gives the user opportunity to choose the class of generation of points. For the data set, x1 to xn, let the one hot encoded class labels be yi, which is c-dimensional, why? Because we have c classes. These are one hot encoded labels. 
Then we use this last function. What, how is it different? So we have log of D of X given Y. Y is the labor. We have also G of Z given Y. What does, what does it mean? So we concatenate the one hot encoded label to the input X for the input to the discriminator. Do you remember in the original GAN, the discriminator only got X as input. Now this put concatenate X and Y, the label, and then feed it to the discriminator. For generator also, in original GAN, we only had Z as input. Now let's have Z and Y concatenated as input to the generator. Then in this way, the GAN learns to care about the label, to care about the label. In the test phase now, the user chooses the desired class label. So Y will be obvious. We concatenate it to the, we concatenate it to the Z noise. We feed it to the generator. It gives us some sample, it generates some data in that class. Interesting, it generates a new point from that class. Okay, the other things we'll co uh, cover in the next uh, session, such as the deep convolutional GAN and other things. Okay, thank you.